upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, an ocean's deep. My faith will stand. And I. Oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. Cause I am yours and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be mine. Well, a very good morning, everyone, and to those that are in the building and to also those that are joining us online today. Um, on behalf of myself, Daniel, I'm the pastor at Edge Church. And on behalf of myself, Joe, Pedro, and the leadership of our church, we want to express our sincere condolences to you as the family and friends that are gathered here and online. And I, I connected with the, the family and just within the beginning. And just our prayer for you as a family is that you would feel the presence of God in this time of loss, in this time of mourning. And so on behalf of us as a church, we express our deepest condolences. Relationships that we have journeyed and, and we feel this with you. And then to everyone else that's joining, friends and family, the family wishes to thank you for being the support in this time. And for those that are present and for also those that are, that are present online today with us. You see, because today we've come to, we've gathered to pay tribute and to give thanks to the life of Mark Burns, who was born on the 23rd of March, 1962, and passes away on the 7th of August of this year. Mark is mourned by his mother, Margaret, his wife, Trisha, his two sons, Guy and Jordan, his sister, Karen, brothers, David and Kevin, and like I said, family and friends that are here, both in person and online. You know, it's in moments like this, I, it's very hard to express the words of condolences, of words to, to bring comfort. And so it's in places like this that my, my first response is always to go to prayer. And it's that place of going to God for prayer to ask for His comfort. And so before we go any further, before we go anywhere more into the service, I want to pray. And pray to invite Jesus, his presence here, because he says that he's come to bring comfort to you and I. And it's comfort that we need in this moment. More than words of man or, or other things, it's, it's a comfort of Jesus that we have to hold on to. And so let's just pray, and I encourage you to invite him into the space to be with you. Father, it's, it's in times of this of deep sorrow and grief that we come to you. Knowing that you, your word says that you will be with us, that you are our confidence, that you are our comfort. And so in this moment, as we've come to, to pay tribute, to, to, to mourn and grieve, but also to celebrate the life of Mark, for those that are in this room, for those online, we need your presence, your comfort to be with us in this space. So we invite you, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm going to hand over to Jo, our community life pastor, and she's going to take us through the reading of God's Word. To the family. Hear God's Word to us today. Colossians 3, 1-4 says, Living as those made alive in Christ. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Mark's life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8 says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, 
and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Mark's race is finished, but he did keep his faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And then Psalm 23, a psalm that the family love. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May this psalm be a comfort to you and to each one of us in this time as we mourn Mark's, Mark's life, as we celebrate his life. May we know that God is our shepherd. He is our comfort. He is our peace. And then John 14, verse 1 to 6, Jesus comforts his disciples. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. Jesus is the way to the Father, and Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Mark is safe with his Father in heaven, and we can, we can have hope in that. And so I just want to pray that God would bless the reading of his word to us today. And that it would be our source of comfort and peace in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand now and we're going to sing a song. It's called How Great Thou Art. Mm -hmm.
Father, we thank you for this moment that we could just be in your presence. Thank you for the comfort of your reading of the word and that we can sing those words that you are a great God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may take your seat. We're going to go to part of our service where it's tributes and dedication. And I, and I often will say this, it's um, a very special, very, very meaningful part of a service. As you hear the life displayed by those closest. And so we hold very close and dear to this moment. And so I'm going to ask um, Rory if you would come up first to share, which is Trisha's brother, as he gives a tribute. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the family, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along this morning to celebrate the life of Mark. And to say goodbye to a very, very special man who has left an incredible legacy of love, kindness, caring. And I'm sure that everyone here today and those listening in can attest to that. The family have received countless phone calls, emails and Facebook messages from friends and family expressing thoughts and prayers. They have been both comforting and consoling during this difficult time and also a reminder of the incredible impact that Mark, Mace, Dad, Uncle, Coach, Mr B had on so many lives. We are eternally grateful for God to give us Mark for just short of 60 years. Mark was born in Mitcham, London moved to Durban and later down into Cape Town, where he was the third born of the Byrne family and he attended Seapoint Boys High. My first memories of Mark was one Sunday morning on the top field at Camps Bay. His dad, Budgie, was often the guest star or guest player in Joe McHugh's Sunday League team. The team was short on this day with only 10 men and Mark filled in at right back. I think it was about 12 or 13 at the time. And an interesting fact for many of us is that Mark played a lot of rugby in primary school and soccer wasn't his love as such. A few years later in 1981, he and I were playing for Lenick. I think he was 19 at the time and his brother David was in the team as well. Um, and this was the year that he started dating my sister Trish. Apparently the story goes that Mark was invited to uh, Ricky Carter Johnson's wedding. He was working for Johnson Sportswear at the time and Janet, his sister, sorted out that Mark's partner for the night would be Tricia and the rest is history. Mark officially joined the family uh, in May of 1990 and they were married in St. Peter's Church in Camps Bay. Now although Mark lived a busy life and I know you all know that, family was very important and at the top of his agenda. He adored Trish, and he was a caring, kind, and generous husband. Mark was also a fantastic role model to his children and his sons. Also, a keen, he, played, he had a very, very keen interest in their lives. His discipline was firm and fair, always insisting on respect and impeccable manners from a young age. He loved his boys. And he was so proud of all their achievements while they were growing up. And so proud of the young men that they have turned out to be today. He loved his boys and having all their friends around, especially on a late Sunday afternoon braai, and also at the Italian club on a Friday night. I will never, ever, and I think many of you can attest to this, forget Mark's handshake. He used to come up to me and he used to say, how are you, sir? in reference to my educational background. And his boys would then follow suit by shaking hands. And I think anybody that's been down to the Lenny Club will know the first thing that happens is out comes the handshake from every single boy, which is just unbelievable. Mark was a father figure of note. There are many young men in the world of soccer and beyond who can testify to Mark being their surrogate dad or father. The love and support that he poured into them and the difference he made in their lives is beyond measure. 
He also loved his nieces. And I believe they all had a very, very special place in his heart. There was never a shortage of hugs and laughter when Mark was around. We always saw Mark as a traditionalist. And when it came to Christmas time, and especially his meal, he loved the annual family Christmas lunch and Christmas Eve functions, and he insisted that a traditional hot English lunch had to be served at the table. No salads were allowed. His mom's roast chicken stuffing was a very, very important part that had to be on the table for Mark, uh, together with the pork lamb gravy, and don't forget the roast potatoes. Mark could eat in those days. Another traditional family moment would be every um, New Year. He would invite the family around, and he would bring out his scottle, and he would do his prawns, and his champagne, and orange juice. So Mark had an incredible generous heart and a strong sense of responsibility to his family, friends, and to the many organizations that he supported. Now we're all aware, and I'm not gonna harp on this one, of his soccer prowess <laughs> and his love and his passion for the beautiful game. But many of you might not be aware of his spiritual journey and his passion for Jesus. We know that Mark was an entrepreneur of note. He was par excellence in those early days. I can just see it. Although he did not do any official tertiary education after school, his drive and his ambition made him very quickly a very successful businessman. He had a house in one of the most sought after suburbs in Cape Town, Camps Bay, Buckhaven. He had a top of the range car. He had a beautiful wife and children and he had a soccer career. What more could a man ask for? And I remember chatting to Mark, and he said to me, Rory, in the eyes of the world, I've made it, but there's still something missing, a void. In these things, worldly stuff cannot fill. He began to question about God, and his search for a greater meaning of life began. He met a guy called the Reverend Winston Dickerson in Seapoint, and he took him under his wing, and his personal relationship started to develop with Jesus. But I think towards the end you will always know that Mark was also a very private person in the midst of all his fame and popularity. In October last year, he popped in to see me with Trish after receiving the news that he had cancer. At first, he told no one about the cancer as he tried to come to grips with the devastating news. Only much later, did he tell his sister and his sons? In the months ahead, it is my understanding that he withdrew from most public interaction. And he chose Langabon as his place of refuge. He used to say to me, it's my quiet place to try and clear my head. He and Tricia often went up to Langabon for the weekends. He always put on a brave face whenever I popped down to see him. Even three weeks ago, when the last time I had a chat, and we were chatting about retirement, and he was saying, what about Langebon? Nice place to buy a house there. And I was saying, no, wilderness. And he was saying, what about Greece? And, he, and then he, we changed the subject, and we went to beautiful wine farms in the Western Cape. And uh, he said, yeah, Van Ruby Castile, there's a lovely spot there. And the following weekend, he booked. And they went to the Grand Hotel, and they had a lovely weekend. And on that weekend, also celebrated Geordie's birthday. But I want to talk from my heart for this one sentence. He said to me, and he was indignant and insistent. He said, Rory, listen to your body. Do your yearly checkups and don't put off seeing any aches and pains. Two people seated here this morning are Fred and Margaret House. Recording who were his pastoral mentors. And they shared, a, I'd like to share a paragraph with you in their tribute to Mark, and I quote, Mark was not afraid of dying. He knew where he was going. His greatest desire was to tell his story so that people, especially his family, will come to know Jesus, not know about Jesus, but to know him intimately as a friend. 
And then he said, my story for God's glory is a little caption that he wrote in his diary. And he shared it with Fred and Margaret. And then he said to Fred and Margaret, when will I tell my story? That was one of the big questions on his heart. And Fred and Margaret said, you're telling your story now, Mark. Your life and the way you've lived it speaks volumes. You made a difference and you left a legacy of note, unquote. So I say, shalom, my brother, until we meet again. Thank you, Rory. Um, I'm going to invite Guy up to share the next tribute. This one will be short and sweet. Um, I had no idea where to start, uh, obviously. I don't think any amount of time could prepare for this. Um, so I'm just going to talk on the past three or four years, that I, the relationship that I had with my dad, because this was when I had some of the fondest memories, and our bond and our relationship, our friendship, grew from strength to strength. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to just keep it there. Dad and I were very similar people, um, psychologically, obviously, not physically. Um, <laughs> um, too similar at times, and we would clash. We would butt heads. Um, it didn't happen often, but when it did, it was a, a standoff. And he would have his say in his booming voice, and I would have mine back in much less of a booming voice. But that's, after that was silence. And the silence could last days, weeks. It all depended on who was going to put their pride in their pocket and, and step forward and apologize. And I think we all know now that Dad did not know how to say or spell sorry. <laughs> but he had his own special way of showing it. Um, and as a family, we learned to read that. Uh, and, and that showed the size, as Roy mentioned, the, the massive heart that he had. But this was the old dad, and this is where I want to pick it up. So not many know this, but the past three to four years, he underwent this transformation. The, you know, the proverbial phoenix rising from the ashes, and he burnt away a lot of the old him, the, the dead wood. And he started to change his perspective on life, and his life, and his mind, and the way he saw the world, and, and as... I got further into my degree in my psychology and I started spending more time with him and working alongside him, coaching and at the club. I almost became his conscience to an extent, this voice of reason in the back of his head as he was going through this process, the angel on his shoulder. And he would ask me questions about the mind and why players make decisions and how could we improve that, how can we help and how can we change that and, 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 and. And, and this was all in the pursuit of him being a better coach, a better mentor, a better person. He would be mid-conversation um, and realize that he wasn't sure of whether he should have such a strong opinion on something or whether he should say it. And he would just stop and he would look at me and say, well, maybe I'm wrong. Ask Jordan, what do you say? And it was then that I'd have to weigh in and, and offer him a different perspective and he would listen. And it was in those tiny moments, those milliseconds where he would just stop and I would realize that he's coming to me. And I finally knew that after 22, 23 years, I had made dad proud. Um, so for the man that he was, which we all know, to, to, to turn to me for some kind of answer or advice or ask me a question that he didn't know, that really made me realize. It was then that I realized and it meant the world to me. Because he was always the one who would, we would go to, and he would give the advice. And at the club, he would have the final say, as we knew until the very end. And I find peace in knowing that this is how I left it, or we left it. 
So dad, I will continue. We will continue in your honor. And we will continue with your passion for the game. If I can be but half of the man you have shown me how to be, I consider it a success. If I can impact a fraction of the amount of people you have in your lifetime, I'll be proud. If I can treat my wife anywhere near as well as what you treated mom, I'll be happy. A better example I could not have asked for, a better father I could never expect, and a better dad could not exist. So more than I was ever able to tell you on earth, I love you. Okay, so you've had the more calm-minded one. Unfortunately, most of you know I'm the more emotional one of the two. Uh, I will do my best to keep it in check. Um, it was difficult, obviously, trying to prepare for this. You, you, you all have your own thoughts and memories and stuff, but obviously just listening to what my brother had to say now just brought back all the memories and all the thoughts, and it's, he shared the same sentiments with me, and it was, you know, it was hard to hear, but also amazing to hear. So mine is just sort of the thoughts that I've had over the last two weeks, or nearly two weeks, um, so yeah, let me just get into it. Dad, my dad is one of a kind. Sure, most people would say that about their dads, but that's the point, isn't it? Whenever I would arrive home, he knew within seconds how I was feeling before I'd even opened my mouth. And no matter what I would say, he'd respond to me with, boy, when you know what you're dealing with, life is easy. And that was something that he would repeat, repeat, repeat. As I got older, I started to realize how true this really was. But standing here today, this is the one thing that I could never have been prepared for. Something I only realized in the last few days now was you were actually preparing me for this day, for life without you. You were so strong and gracious and would always put on a brave face for me whenever I would come and see you, even when you were having the worst of your days. Learning to spend the quiet times with you, again, was preparing me for the silence that we now have in your absence. Not having your booming voice to calm me, yes, I actually found peace in your loudness. For anyone who's ever heard you shouting on the sideline, I can assure you it's a whole lot louder when it's coming from your room. <laughs> you were the hardest on those that you loved the most, but you did it out of love and care because it was in those that you saw the most potential and the most that they could actually bring out with you and for you. I'm forever grateful for being your son, the next generation of the burn name. Right from a baby, I knew I'd been blessed with an amazing dad, a man who loved me and raised me to be the man I am today, to be strong, to stand up for what I believe in and to stand firm, to be a pillar of strength and consistency for those around me. The quiet and the still moments we shared in the last... Just me? I can everyone hear that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the quiet and still moments we shared in the last few months were there to teach me how to slow down from time to time and appreciate each and every little thing that makes what life what it is. Even in the bad days and moments, to change what my perception and be grateful for life and health. This is something you taught me without us ever saying a word about it. You taught me as an emotional being to learn to control my emotions and understand everyone is different that I shouldn't take things personally, but to look at it objectively and as to why someone acts or says something the way they do. All these lessons you were showing me through the way that you actually just lived your life, even during your times of suffering and pain. One of the things I've come across while trying to learn how to cope with your suffering that you went through was that it's all part of your life, it's all part of your book. It's Mark Byrne, the book, the life story. You were never content with your achievements and successes as, mu as proud as you may have been. There was always more that you wanted to learn or try, and you never took your foot off the pedal. You always wanted to do more, to help more, to change things for the better. Even when people turned against you or let you down, you never held grudges and nor judgments. You are my hero, and the life you afforded us as a family is something I'll be eternally grateful for. You are my role model, and I pray that I will be able to build my family to be the loving, caring, and safe place that you afforded us as your family. I will carry you with me forever, and I know you'll be looking down on me, coaching me from heaven. We will need to have many training sessions, half-time chats, post-match discussions, but hopefully not too many of the hair-dryer hair treatments. You lived your life for us, your family, your everything. You loved mom in a way I've never seen anyone love someone before. You dedicated your life to being the ultimate father. This, is the, this I promise to emulate in my life for my family. You worked so hard, sacrificed so much, early mornings, long days, late nights, coming home to see me playing Xbox, and you would just shake your head and carry on. 
Just to make you sure that your family could have everything possible, you supported and encouraged us to try new things. You made a way to provide for us in ways that I'll never fully comprehend. Even in one of your final acts, you made sure that Mom, George, and I, and our families to come, will have the best possible lives ahead of us, thanks to your selfless and amazing love. You're a selfless man. You would do anything for anyone in need. You never really, you never fully received the recognition in every instance, but the personal satisfaction you received was enough for you. This is something that I need to learn too. I can only hope to become half the man that you are, Dad. And after hearing my brother say this, you can be proud of us. You are truly one of a kind. We would often sit and banter back and forth about whenever we heard someone being considered a legend. More often than not, we'd laugh and decide that the word being thrown around more and more sounded like imposter. But Dad, you are a real legend. The legacy you've spent your life dedicating to the development and the betterment of others is something we will hold on to and take forward with us in our lives. I still wonder sometimes how you, without showing off, would more often than not figure out the things before any of us could. When you were on the football field explaining a drill or looking for what you were looking for, you'd finish explaining and then you'd demonstrate, and you'd ping the ball exactly where it needed to be, to the reaction and the laughter of your Mr. B. I guess that's why you'd always tell us. That's why Dad is Dad, with that wry smile, the same smile that gave Jordan our frown line. But we love you all the same. Nothing gave you greater happiness than to see your family happy and those around you that you could impact and impart some of your knowledge and passion to. I think everyone sitting here today could share, and joining us online, I'm sure, could share at least one story of the role that you played in their life at some point or another. That would leave everyone sitting here with a smile and probably a couple of tears. Going anywhere with you was one of my favorite things to do, even though it would usually mean whatever we were doing would take forever because someone would stop you to talk football. <laughs> From petrol attendants recognizing you or wanting to talk football to football lovers and old friends at games, you made time for everyone. Either that, or you were busy on your phone, but you were always busy doing something that was for the benefit of us. This is all part of the process of being, of getting to where you got to. I'll never forget talking to you, hearing, hearing you say, "Hi, boy, you're right," or "Well done, boy," and the best one of the lot. And I don't actually know if I ever heard my dad say, "I love you." It was always "Love you lots," and that was always that will always stick with me. But with that being said, even there were just ways that he would look at us, or we just knew it was never a question. There was never any doubt in anyone's mind that our dad loved us with his whole heart. Just a, something random that I've found here now as well. Just you used to play the most random songs, most often times far too loud, off your phone or your laptop as I think most dads do. I'll take that with a pinch of salt. Um, and it used to drive us crazy. It really did. Um, to the point where we'd sometimes end up laughing and almost crying of like, just can you stop? But I thank you for being you. I am the man I am as a result of your amazing, humble and gracious soul. Well, dad, there's no way I could ever have run out of things to say about you. And we never will. And we'll sit and have many discussions about you and it will never, everywhere I go, I'm sure somebody's going to have some story to tell me. But for right now, Dad, love you lots. We'll be together again one day in heaven. I miss you today. And I miss you every step of the way. But I know you'll never be far. Your guy guy, your boy. And next we're going to have um, Keegan and Caitlin. They're going to come up and they're going to just share and give a tribute. Um, hello, everyone. Okay, this is just something from my heart um, to my Uncle Mark. <sighs> to many, he was known as Mr. B, but to me, he was known as Uncle Mark. And to this day, I will call him that, even though he disliked it and always said, don't call me uncle. From a young age, I saw him as a very intimidating figure with this gruff voice that I always walked in the opposite direction to. <laughs> As I've grown older, I've seen an uncle that has such a soft and helpful heart. I would describe him as a giant with the most loving heart. 
He always wanted myself and my sister to achieve our full potential in, in life, and any way, he could do th in, any way he could help us, he would. Anything we needed in our life, we know that our Uncle Mark would go out of his way to make this happen. He urged us to follow our dreams, study and work hard. He was very stern on putting on hours in university and ultimately achieving our degrees, which is what he got to see myself and my sister graduate with. All I ever wanted to do in my life was to make my Uncle Mark proud, which he told me so many times, and it warms my heart and it'll stay with me forever. Having lost Grandad Budgie and now Uncle Mark is a pain I cannot bear. Grandad passed away while we were so young, so all we have to go off is others' memories and stories. However, I felt so close to Grandad Budgie because Uncle Mark was the closest thing we had to Grandad Budgie. <laughs> From all the stories, Uncle Mark had so many qualities that Grandad Budgie did. The best one being his football knowledge. I could sit with him all day and listen to him talk about life, football, his faith, and so many other things. I admired and respected his opinion more than anything. In moments where I felt lost and confused, I always thought to myself, let me go ask Uncle Mark what he would think. He always remained neutral, but gave a very realistic opinion on matters in life. Many days I would sit at his house at Edmead, at Edmead, in Edgemead and had a Lenick and think to myself, what a man. The way he carries himself is just unbelievable. Everyone he came into contact with, he impacted them in some way or another. He dedicated his life to not only football, but to a Lenick. He spent many hours giving input on and off the field, which aided in so many players' successful careers. A memory I will hold with me is that I, a few weeks ago, myself and my sister sat with him, discussing the Mark Byrne philosophy and how he viewed football. He sat for about an hour, explaining the game, how he viewed it, asking any questions that we asked in order to better ourselves as coaches and lovers of the game. Uncle Mark was always the head of the family, the pillar that held the Byrne family together. He brought us all together on so many occasions and always, was always proud to stand up for the Byrne family in a crowd of people. Uncle Mark, your presence is missed. Whenever you walked into a room, you could see the way people respected you. I miss your chirps, the looks you used to give people, but more importantly, your hugs. He was never one to give much affection, but you got the odd wink every now and again. But one thing I know was that my Uncle Mark loved my sister and I. He always told us how much he loved us and how proud he was of us. He was always the protective uncle, the one who defended us on any occasion and had our backs through it all. Your journey was kept with cancer was one that I admired. My mom always kept me updated as if I was there. You fought your journey with so much humility, and in order to have humility, you must have your faith, and that's what you had. I respected how you viewed God and your faith. You included God in every walk of every aspect of your life. <laughs> to my dear mother, you have been everyone's pillow of strength while Uncle Mark has gone through this journey. You've taken up the role as the head of the family and showed, showed an unbelievable fight to keep everyone going. You spent every day with Uncle Mark these past 11 months. When this journey came about, you said you were going to dedicate your days, time, and whatever your brother needed, and you did exactly that. I cannot express in words how my heart aches for you. You've lost your little brother, your closest sidekick. I know Grandad Budgie, is sitting up there with, the, with him and thinking, how have we left Karen to run the Byrne family? <laughs> Uncle Mark, this was never part of the plan. There was so much more I wanted you to see me experience in my life. <sighs> From the Byrne family. As a brother, he stepped in when we lost our dad and became the head of the house, someone we all looked up to and who led from the front and was an inspiration to us all to my precious brother from Karen. I was always so proud to be your sister and was truly blessed to spend so much time with you throughout this journey. The saying that those who've had cancer truly brought us, un had cancer truly understand, brought us so close together. 
and I understand so much of what you went through. You dealt with it with such grace and humility. You never questioned and never got angry. You endured so much and accepted that this was God's plan for you. I know how difficult it was for you to let go and have to rely on everybody else as you have always done so much for everyone else. I loved how you were always so kind and caring and always put everyone else before yourself. I was always in awe of the impact that you had on so many people's lives. You taught me so many things and I loved being part of being able to help you with the Linux. Our trip to Ruby Castile a few weeks ago was so special and I will cherish those memories with me. I love and I miss you terribly as a son. I will always cherish all the memories and hold them dear to me, just like the day I held you in my arms for the first time. As a family, you've taught us so much in life, but not how to live without you. Our family chain is broken. Nothing seems the same. But as God calls us one by one, the links will join again. Rest easy, Uncle Mark, until we meet again. Sorry, I'm a bit old school here with my piece of paper and the iPads and cell phones. Sorry, I'm a bit old school here. Oh, no, there's only two pages, all right. Okay, so um, I'm a, a bit different here, but um, at the beginning of the year, I was asked to step in and head up the Women's Football at Atlantic Football Club. A role that seemed rather fitting considering our involvement in, foot, in the football community as the Burn and Hunt family. I've heard we've had some pretty good footballers and coaches come through with both of those surnames, but don't quote me on that. Although my interactions and chats with Uncle Mark growing up were always intellectual, thought-provoking, and left me inspired to make a difference in the world, football became the most prominent topic of conversation since the start of this year. Although it's always been a topic in our household since it, we could walk and talk. I figured it would only be fitting to pay tribute to Uncle Mark using the football knowledge that he passed down to me, and hence decided to liken Mark's greatest attributes or character traits to that of the starting 11. Although one could never truly depict Mark's character in one single page or speech, we would certainly be here past curfew, and I can hear him shouting, weeds, don't overcomplicate things, keep it simple. So here goes. Starting with our goalkeeper at number one, whose key attributes are include to command the box, be a good communicator and organise his defenders. Mr B's presence is and will be missed at the club. A common phrase which has been said about the late Mr B. A man whose presence was felt from the moment he stepped into a room, and if you didn't feel his presence, you most certainly heard his voice. You will be missed today, tomorrow and for years to come. However, your legacy will live on. Moving to the right and left back. Both have to be good tacklers, have a good understanding when to commit, when to drop off, when to overlap and join in their attack. Mark was committed to developing players and people into better individuals. He emphasised the importance of education, development on and off the field. He thoroughly enjoyed passing knowledge on to others and was always willing to give advice to others no matter the time of day. I will miss our chats, especially about life and football. The game is crying out for a man with your football knowledge. He, is, he fulfilled his dream of having a football academy and it is only fitting that it was under the Hellenic name. Although there is so much room for growth at Hellenic and hence we will continue his philosophy, his work and always hope to make him proud. The two centre backs who communicate and organise the players around them, who are both confident to lead the team and command the respect of the teammates. Mark Byrne, the man, the myth, the organiser. A man who would organise anything for anyone without asking for anything in return, no matter how big or small the favour or task was. A man who emphasised the importance of having respect for others. A simple example, as mentioned earlier, included that every Hellenic player when arriving to the training, to the training pitch, is to greet every staff and coach member before entering onto the pitch. Without questions, all players perform this task. I'm amazed at every session by this. He is respected not by, by many, not only in the football community, but through all walks of life. Mark Byrne, truly one of a kind. Moving to our two centre midfielders, who must be both technically good in all areas, comfortable on the ball, patient in decision making. Mark Byrne may not have been the most patient, but, he, but, he, but definitely when it came to decision making, it was always well thought through. I admired his ability to stay true to himself and to always stand by the decisions he made. To our two wingers, both needing to be good athletes with good intelligence to beat the fullbacks and deliver, to, deliver a quality cross, they need to both understand when and when to drop off and offer defensive assistance. Mark Byrne had the ability to listen, understand and offer advice, 
Mark was extremely selfless and always wanted each individual he came into contact with to achieve their best, and he would ensure that he could help in any way he would. He helped me get into university and help achieve my, my degree. And yes, I had to send my marks to him each term. He impacted, me, he impacted me and so many lives, and he always wanted to ensure that any individual who interacted with him left not only as a better footballer or whatever career path they chose, but as a better person. The number nine, the ideal striker who can do a little bit of everything, who makes runs in behind and is able to hold up the ball. The late Budgie Byrne, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, number nine of all time. You can definitely quote me on that. Having Grandad pass away at a young age, Uncle Mark resembled Grandad in so many ways. He assumed the role of the protector in the Byrne family without hesitation. He would always make sure that everyone he cared, cared about was taken care of. Mark was strong in his beliefs, faith, and held God's, God very close to his heart, something I admired about him. He said, with strong faith, one could achieve anything. Our last conversation included these very words. Weeds, don't hesitate. Follow your dreams. The world is for your taking. I hope you and Grandad are causing havoc up there. But Uncle Mark, you didn't have to leave so soon. Which leads me to the final player, the playmaker in the team. Technically, he or she should be the best player in the team. Good first touch, dribbling with purpose, creative and can play as a pivot player, as well as make runs in behind. The late Mark Byrne, how it hurts to say that, a visionary of the game with technical and tactical, tactical knowledge and intelligence that coaches nowadays aspire to attain. The football paternity has lost a true legend. I had so much more to learn from you and so much that I wanted to achieve with you by my side. I know that you will be watching over me during this journey of life and I always hope to make you proud. You have left a void that cannot or will never be filled. We as a family have to slowly put the pieces back together again. You didn't have to go so soon. Who's going to cut the turkey at Christmas this year? And I most certainly hope you're not hiding the palace book up there with you. Mark Byrne, gone, but never forgotten. His legacy will live on now and for generations to come. Thank you. And now I'm going to invite up Gavin as he shares. Hello. Well, I'm clearly out of a job tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, John. <laughs> um, yes, you know, to come together on this real sad occasion, um, um, I, I prefer to remember Mark, certainly one of my best teammates. Um, you know, we just lost one last season. Certainly my closest mates, Skunzi and Mace. I'm sure they're up there now. I mean, Mark scored more own goals for Skunzi than I've ever seen in my life. Um, I remember one Sunday afternoon at the, the Balmy uh, Witbank Black Aces where the, they just took the cows and the, and the sheep off. There wasn't much grass, as you know. And the goalkeeper kicked it and bounced on the halfway line and Mace went Skunzi with a volley, but Skunzi was standing on the edge of the box and went in the top corner. <laughs> so he scored more own goals for Patrick, so I'm sure the two of them are having a good laugh at the moment. Uh, firstly, um, to my condolences to the family and Trish and the boys and my girls and that. And uh, obviously Kevin, um, David, and my, you know, and to Mrs. B, Sybil, sorry, <laughs> I wish to call you that. <laughs> I got uh, introduced to the family at a very good few years ago, but must be over 43, 44 years ago. Um, in those days, it was a, a school league and I was from that side of the mountain, the poor seats, which is all the poor ones where at Observatory Boys High which our motto was uh, long live the spanner against uh, Seapoint Boys Eye, which was our big rivals. I mean, Kevin, I'm sure I remember you played in the curtain raise in the 1976. Uh, Captain said he played Lennox there at that Rand Stadium. Um, I came through, Mark was obviously two years older than me. Um, you know, and uh, I was at the game and the old man was there and all he just said to me, you know, with those knees that he had, they looked like saucers. He said, I'll see you tomorrow, son, at training. And obviously I was 17 at the time and uh, went down to Lenick and you walk into a dressing room full of Tony Lupton, Paul Daniels, Donald Reich, Keith Forrest, uh, Des Bacos, Malcolm Fulbys, legends, big, big players. And I was a 17 year old boy from observatory, uh, arrived on my bicycle, never had a car. Actually Mark taught me how to drive. He took me for driving lessons in that brand new Toyota Corolla. <laughs> the Byrne family rocked up at training with his Toyota Corollas, 
David in a silver one, uh, Mark in a brown one, Kevin in a green one, and the old man in the big crusader. And uh, I think the gearbox is still there at High Level Road at Camps Bay because my clutch and plate wasn't so good. But Mark taught me how to drive. He said to me, uh, that's the first thing you've got to do. You can't be coming on your bicycle all the way from Kenilworth to Hartley Vale every day for training and going back at 8 o'clock at night. Um, and obviously I had a big accident, almost got killed on the bicycle. Anyway, that's when he said, I'm going to teach you to drive. The first paycheck I got was Elia, 90 rand a month, 50 rand a win and 25 rand a draw at Hellenic, 1981. And um, Mark said to me, what are you going to do with your money? I said, well, I don't know, spend it. <laughs> he said to me, save your, save your monthly salary and, and, and live off the bonuses. I said, Mark, we're not going to win many games here, <laughs> which we did, actually. We won quite a few games, and that was one of the first lessons Mark taught me about uh, trying to look after life after. When I arrived at Lenny, he was two years older than me, and he looked after me, took me in. Um, he was my roommate. I still miss those cup of teas he used to make for me in the morning. And... Um, you know, we became mates, and uh, he's certainly one of my best mates in football that I played with, and we've had a relationship. And obviously, over the last few years, where I've been obviously out of town, we spoke a lot on football matters. I mean, youth development was a thing of his heart, so close to his heart, and I would really, I mean, I'd offer my, to the boys, if we could keep this thing going, Lenny Football Club, and John, and Gulam, and I see people around here. You know, it's a club that's got great legacy. I mean... One of the reasons why we're all here is the Hellenic Football Club. We all grew up, I mean, you know, I mean, the players that came from Hellenic, from Seapoint Boys Eye and Observatory Boys Eye, I mean, we weren't the brightest oaks. We could, I, so I can't write a speech. <laughs> but we had passion, we had love, we had desire. You know, we had, we had all the attributes that I think the old man Budge liked in us, you know. Um, Mace left Hellenic many, many times. He had more comebacks than Muhammad Ali. <laughs> at Hellenic, because he was running back to Tricia at Camps Bay. Trish, he told me when he met you, he was going to marry you. I said, yeah, Mace, yeah, you're right, yeah. And uh, he did, and he, you know, in his family was everything. I think he went over to America, came back. He was a footballer for me that was underachieved. I don't mean it in a bad way, Mark. But he was a lazy footballer. He was the worst trainer I've ever seen in my life. Hated training. But when the balls came out, he was a different animal. Um, his passing ability from the back, with the outside of the foot, that's why Dr. Sternberg gave him more injections in his ankle than I've ever seen in my life. He was brave, he was tough, uncompromised. You know, he climbed into people. I mean, Mace could pick a fight in a phone booth by himself, you know. <laughs> the standoff arguments with the old man, but I'll tell you a story with Budgie and, and Mark. Budgie was always trying to lend money off Mark. And, uh, you know, it was Mace this, Mace said, when you needed money, it was Mark. Mark, please, can I get some money? <laughs> yeah, but you're not going to pay me back. Don't worry, I'll pay you back. <laughs> but he obviously never paid him back. But... Uh, the standoff arguments and the, and, and the I mean, Tlapi and, and Paul and everybody will tell you, Nevin, Gazia. I mean, it was, it was actually a comedy in, it was to watch in the dressing rooms at halftime. But there was so much passion, you know, and, and desire in Mark. And he wanted to do well. He always stood up for the players around him. I mean, he certainly looked after me as a young boy coming in there. And I'll forever be grateful to, you know, for that. Um, as I said, my biggest concern is we need the club to keep going. You know, if I can help in any way, and I'm sure we can, we can. I mean, I saw boys there yesterday, last night, that certainly could play at a much higher level in the under-18s there, you know. And all they need is a chance. So to Mark, um, until we meet again, that back four is starting to get built up there, you know. And I'm sure um, Skunzi, you and, and Budge and all the people that have gone on, you know, in the football fraternity from Cape Town, uh, they will be having a good laugh and, uh, you know, until we meet again, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously we are in a difficult season when it comes to COVID and protocols. And so there were many more that would love to have been here to also have given tributes. Um, and so we've been able to put a video together of tributes from those who are not here and those that are also here. So take a look at the screen. We always had this thing over our head, the Mark Byrne factor. The Mark Byrne that was always able to develop players with a shoestring budget, consistently year after year producing players, giving young kids opportunities to become professional. And the respect you have to have for Mark is that he did it on his own. He did it without the corporate backing. He did it without a PSL status club that ultimately has a certain amount of funding. So uh, it's big respect to Mark and uh, 
I think he's going to be missed, missed, missed in this football fraternity. Uh, he was part of me when I went for my first trips to, to Europe with Arsenal with his father, Roger Byrne. Uh, we stayed at his, at, at his family's place. Yeah, if, if, if you ask me today, he was part of that. He was a big role that I played, in, that I started to play in Europe and my, my professional football. You know, it was all about the details. You know, if I see videos of him also on, on the social media, he liked the details. It was all about details with Mark Byrne. You, you could not cut shortcuts with Mark Byrne. If it was to do with picking up weights, if it has to do with, with shooting, passing, it was always detailed. And I think if you ask any youth player that came after us or after me, it was exactly the same. So yes, he was a, he played a big role in my, my professional football. But in my three years being at Alinic, I'm so glad for Mr. B to change my life from taking me out of my area in Kensington, of the background that I came from and for being there for me every step of the way, from coming to visit the house and coming to look at how the area is. From, and for me personally to thank him for taking me out of Kensington Football Club to Hellenic and to learn and to grow. And for me that three years learned me a lot, grew me a lot. It improved me a lot over the years. And from there, I am here at Cape Town City today and I play in the national team. I would like to thank him for everything he done for me and for, for keeping me and like improving me every season as I was there for three years. Yeah, Mr. B played a big role in my life. He, I could say he was an inspiration to me. He was the one that always guided me in the right direction. There were many times that other clubs wanted me from Cape Town, but he was the one that always told me that I should stay and he will make a living for me going forward, you know, and yeah, today I can thank him. I'm here at Cape Town City and um, I'm very appreciated for what he did in my life when he was still alive and yeah, I appreciate what he did for me, his family and for my family, what he did for my family and I'm grateful today for what he did. In fact, it became so apparent that when I used to get annoyed with coaches that didn't do enough or didn't produce the players well enough or didn't come up with the results, I would always, always say, how does Mark do it? How does Mark have this Midas touch that when he's worked with certain players, they have something that comes into their system in terms of their development. And I always say, you know what, you know what we need? We need a Mark Byrne. We need somebody that can create something that you can't put down in in words, in, in, in actions. It's just that personality that he had, that resilience, that tough outer strength that he constantly put out. Um, at the time, it made it lighter for, for my parents, you know, because at the time, um, my father was the only one working, providing for the family. And um, I think staying on the academy helped us as a family as well, because they put us through school that was it was one less thing for my parents to, to have worried about, you know. Um, so it, it helped a lot uh, for me as an individual as well as, as for the family. Um, I was so hoping that, that my little brother, who is now 14 years old, could um, could work with Mr. Byrne. You know, I was always pushing, please go to Mr. Byrne, join Mr. Byrne. Yeah, um, it was a great feeling because obviously I knew that that is what he wanted for me. You know, like I said, he believed in me even more than what I believed in myself at the time. I was low in confidence and he really, really believed in me. And that was a step in the right direction for me. Like I said, I never regretted joining Alenic, you know, because after Alenic, after I was done with Alenic, you know, it was only upwards for me. So, you know, it was obviously great for me. And also, um, you know, he believed in me so much that he he, he, he took me to, to Denmark to try to know children. Who does that, you know? So. You know, I always be grateful for him and for what he's done for me. Yeah, I remember Mark Ben uh, as a father, as a guardian, somebody who saw potential in me that nobody saw. Uh, he actually gave me a lease at life. You know, I'm a professional soccer player today because uh, he took me in as a young boy uh, in the Hellenic Academy. Uh, he did so much for me, paid for my fees. So he, he didn't only play the part in football, but then in life in general. Because when he took me over to Cape Town, uh, I knew nothing about the Cape Town culture. I knew nobody in Cape Town. But then he was there, you know, making sure that, you know, I never needed anything. 
you know, uh, I became who I am in Cape Town because, you know, he instilled a professional, a professional, a, how can, a professional attitude in me. And, you know, uh, I will forever be grateful that, you know, I met Mark Ben in life, you know. Uh, uh, he, he, wherever he is, uh, he must know that, you know, I will always love him. Uh, I lost a dad, you know. Yeah, Mark, Mark couldn't stand losing, eh? And, uh, you know, I remember we were selected to go and play in uh, Johannesburg as a Cape, Cape 11. And uh, Mark Williams was in, in the starting lineup as a striker, I was playing next to him. Mark was at the back, Gavin Hunt was at the right back. And in the bus, Mark lost his temper because uh, we, we lost the game and, and Mark Williams was messing around in the bus after the loss. He, punches were flying in the bus and then we had to control him. But you know, that's Mark and you, you had to accept that he just, you know, he was just had this resilience, he just wanted to win, couldn't stand losing. And uh, it rubs off on you and uh, having him on your side is always better than playing against him. Mr. B, I would like to thank you for everything. I know you're not here today. You, in heaven, looking down at us. You're still looking after us. Still looking after the Hellenic Football Club and still grooming kids that can make it into professional football careers. And thank you for everything what you've done for me and for whatever you've done for every one of us. Okay, Mr. B, you're no longer there with us anymore. And I'm very grateful for what you did for me and my family. You were a father figure to me. You were my father, like on the pitch. You were my father on the pitch. And I think today I can be very grateful for you, for what big part you played in my life. And yeah, today I'm, today you're not here anymore. So may your soul rest in peace. Mr. Byrne, thank you for everything, Mr. Byrne. Thank you for investing in me. Thank you for giving me opportunity when I was only 10 years old. Taking, putting me on the academy, looking after me for six, seven years I'm at the academy. Thank you for, for all the life lessons on the field and off the field. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your support. Thank you for so, so much. You've, um, you've not only played a, a, a coach figure, but you also played a, a father figure to many of, of us, to, um, to, to the family, to the Byrne family and, and, and friends and and loved ones and football community. Um, thank you for for sharing Mr. Byrne with the world. Thank you for allowing us to for allowing us to be part of, of Mr. Byrne's life and my deepest sympathy to to each each of you and may God's peace and comfort flood your hearts and minds in this time of, of, of sorrow. Yeah you see it goes beyond for my for, for us uh, as as Greek origin uh, Mark flew the flag of Hellenic, you know. Whilst we ran other clubs and owned other clubs, Hellenic was always somewhere in our heart. And uh, having played for Hellenic, uh, my, my four kids have all gone through the Hellenic uh, uh, Academy. You know, it's, it's, it's really touching. And to, to lose somebody at the age of 59, there are no words. Mark was a legend. You know, um, I can imagine Mr. B, you know, shouting me from heaven. Russian, come on hit the ball or make the tackle or run after someone you know that was a, that that is how he was he was a winner you know he always wanted to succeed and he knew how to get the best out of someone you know uh, everyone who played under mr b you know they wanted to play for him there was a bigger motivation he was that you know he was like i said he was always in our corner you know and i just want to say um to the burn family sorry for your loss you know, we are with you i just hope you guys find comfort in this difficult time Hi, Mr. Byrne, wherever you are right now, I'm sure you will find my father also on, in heaven with you. And all I want to say, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done for me, for all the players that came after me. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that your sons and your wife will, lead the, will, will still keep going with Alenic. And I have no doubt they will still be becoming good players from Alenic in remembrance of you. Mark, I know that you've contributed to this game and you know it, we all know it. And uh, whilst we've had our differences in many instances over players and I'm trying to get your player, you're trying to get my player, the respect will never go and uh, you as a burn have contributed to this game and uh, it'll never be forgotten.
A moment like this, words that were spoken, captures the heart of a person and a family and a legacy. So my apologies if I lean over this way often because my address is really to the family, to the friends that have walked this journey with Mark and spent life and did life with him. I want to draw your attention to one verse. It's found in the book of John. It's when Jesus is doing his farewell, his last moments with his followers. He took a bunch of men that were nobodies. They weren't the group that was selected in the former days when Jesus lived on earth. There were many rabbis. There were many people who would become part of a rabbinical school. But you had to qualify. You had to come from the right background. You had to write the right pedigree. But Jesus went down and found fishermen. I grew up in a community. My mother was Greek. My father was Afrikaans. Strange combination. But one of the loves that my mother instilled was fish, and so we'd often go down to the harbor. And uh, the polite language wasn't the language that my mother would often use in the home. But the fishermen were rough, and together they formed a bond. The sea had something that drew them together, the life experiences, the storms, The uncertainty, will there be a catch? Won't there be a catch? And into that world, Jesus molded these 12 men. He listened to their ups and their downs. He had to deal with some of the challenges. But one thing he gave them, he gave them his life. He gave all that he had to them. Not once did he quit on them. And now he comes to the final closing comments that he has to leave them. He's going to be crucified. Now he starts preparing them in John chapter 10, a good few chapters before, when he says, I'm the great shepherd. And then he says a strange thing, I'm going to lay my life down for you. They just don't get it. They don't follow what he's trying to say, lay your life down. And then in John chapter 11, a very dear friend of his, Lazarus, dies and he goes to the tomb and he weeps there. And Mary says, what's what's this? Why why didn't you come earlier? Why do you disappoint us? And his response was, Mary, I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, even if you die, you'll never, ever die speaking of eternal life. They still don't follow it. John chapter 12, a lady comes and takes a perfume and anoints his feet and the disciples say, leave him alone, don't interfere. And he says, no, 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 she's anointing me for my death. They still don't get it. And then in John chapter 13, he breaks bread at the Last Supper and he says, As Luke's gospel records, this is my body which is broken and they they don't get it. Because nobody gets and embraces death. But it's one of our realities of life. We don't have a dinner discussion and we're talking about rugby or football. And somebody comes up with a topic and says, hey, you know, I was thinking about death. Well, everybody gets off and goes and stands around the fire. And that's why Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. And then in verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. It's a peace that the world can't give you. It's that question that Mark says, I have all these things I've achieved, but there's something still missing. 
He found the peace of God in the moments that I spent with him at Trish. We went into that place where we could just experience God's peace. And I assure you, he knew the peace of God knowing that he was dying. I want you just to hear these words again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you the peace that the world gives. What Jesus is just saying is the peace that comes from me. It's a gift. It's a gift. I don't hold it. I give it to those who are troubled and in pain. We weep the lost today. Of Mark. Don't hold back the tears. But I want to let you know there's a gift, a gift that he says, I'm going to give you. You know what a gift is? You have to reach out and take it. And it's the peace of God. So my prayer for this family, not this family, excuse me, the family and the friends and those who were on the screen talking of what Mark impacted their lives. My desire is that you would know this peace that God gives to you because of his love for you. I want you to just take a short moment with me as I pray. We can't conjure up this peace. We can't rush around and find it. It's a peace that only comes from you. And so now we're in our moments of sorrow, in our moments of mourning. I ask that you would bring peace to each one as you offer it to them, to a mother, to a wife, to children, to nieces, to friends, to sisters, brothers. Bring peace in this moment to each one. Amen. Now one of the things about life is that we're not always there alongside when someone dies. I spent a number of years as a missionary on the Angolan border. And I learned a custom which I treasure till this day. In those days when someone died and they called and I would go and you'd have to bury them. There were no funeral arrangements or funeral parlors, you had to bury them. But then the word would be sent out. And people would walk for days. I literally mean days. To come and sit with the family. And the fire would be going. And you'd hear the walking and the wailing. They'd sit around and eat. And then one would get up and sit. Oh, my heart is rejoicing. My heart is sad. And they will talk about the person, very much what we did. And they honored him, although they couldn't be with him in his last moments. I'm going to ask you to listen to a song on the screen. And say your goodbyes. Not ever to be forgotten, but ever to be remembered in our hearts. i
you just to stay in this moment and just to bow your heads let this be a private moment for each and every person and then we say goodbye goodbye my beloved son my darling husband My dad, my brother, my uncle, and my close, close friend. Thank you for the life you lived. Thank you for who you were, what you brought into our lives. Thank you for journeying with us. And now we give you into the eternal resting arms of our Father. The ever-loving surrounding arms of our dear Heavenly Father. Who awaits and has prepared a place for Him. Mark, you have come into your rest. May God keep and sustain and surround those who mourn and weep today with the eternal knowledge that he is secure in the loving arms of God. Bring peace and solace to the family and to the loved ones. In the name of the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As we come to the close, there's going to be a thanks from Rory, but I'd like to ask you just uh, as a moment of honoring to stand as we pronounce the benediction. And now, may the grace, the love, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you. And walk with you henceforth from this day forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, receive our thanksgiving for a life lived and a life honored. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm going to ask Rory to come and give thanks. Please take your seat. God, thank you. Just a few uh, thank yous. And uh, I just, what a beautiful memorial service. I'd like to thank Edge Church for yeah, hosting us this morning. Thank Pedro and Daniel for officiating and sharing God's word. And also, Pedro, for those last couple of months, all the time that you've spent with uh, Mark. To the media team, I'd like to thank you for making it possible that all the people that were not able to be present here this morning could join us in celebrating Mark's memorial. Um, and then, your daughters have already said it, but to Karen, you've been a pillar of strength, and that's my words, but they said it before me. Your ongoing help, guidance, and organizational skills are greatly appreciated by the family. Then to Gershwin Kutsia, thank you for the role you've played in being spokesperson for the Byrne family and assisting with all the communications that are taking place today and also on Sunday. Thank you to Wendy for the beautiful flowers that we see before us. And then the Byrne family would also this morning like to acknowledge the support from Irene and the Rocks family over the past few years and during this difficult time. And then I say thank you to Guy and Jordan for the key roles that you guys have played and the personal contributions that you've made in ensuring that today goes well and that Friday and Sunday also run smoothly. At this stage, normally, we would say, well, you're welcome to join us for a cup of tea and a chat. But sadly, due to COVID, that will not take place today. But I just want to say that, yeah, that hopefully that time will come when we can all meet and have a good drink and chat about Mark and all that he means to us, to the family and all that. Apparently, there is a little something on the way out um, for you to take with you as a memory. Thank you. Thank you. And again, on behalf of Edge Church, uh, uh, we are with you and supporting you. And I'm going to ask that the family, they make their way out now um, into the front, and then the rest of us can, can lead out in that way. And please do grab the special treat that's been organized. Um, so, yeah. When you walk through a storm Hold your hand up high And don't be afraid of the dark At the end of a stone There's a golden sky and the sweet silver sound of love. Walk on through the wind. Walk on through the rain. For your dreams be tied.